The cultural history of the Western Hemisphere prior to the advent of the European conquerors is so dim that even although in the last 50 years a great deal of work has been done, we are still in no condition or position to arrive at conclusions or to attempt a general reconstruction of the situation. Broadly speaking, there is much evidence that the three Americas have been inhabited for a very long time. Some schools of modern anthropology are even suspecting that the records of human existence in the Western Hemisphere may be as long and old as anything to be found in the Eastern Hemisphere. Be this as it may, we are almost entirely dependent upon so-called natural records. Through the excavation of mounds and the examination of ruins, we try to piece together the story of Amerindian culture. The possibility of Asiatic influence or even European influence cannot be eliminated even when we think of comparatively early times. There is a general suspicion that this continent was populated from Asia. Certainly, there were streams of migration over what we call the Aleutian Island chain and Bering Strait. But to me, it has always seemed a little difficult to agree wholeheartedly with Dr. Hardlicker in his thinking in this direction. It seems to me that these ancient migrations do not explain the cultural pattern that existed here at the time of the conquest. It would seem more probable that travelers, adventurers, perhaps shipwrecked mariners, did reach the western continents from some other cultured area perhaps two, three, or four thousand years ago. Something happened here that is not fully explained by any of the records now available to us. Considering, for example, the possibility of migration from Asia by other routes than those at the far north, we know that certain currents are such that it is quite possible to drift from Asia uh, to the west coast of Central America. This drift would be very largely the result of currents which, however, are not so fortunate if the wanderer wants to drift home again. Thus, they would appear to have been the possibility of a one-way travel at a very early time from Asia. We also know that down in the Polynesian area, navigation by means of very large canoes was advanced perhaps further than we realize. We know that in these areas there are canoes that can and have traveled three, four, five thousand miles. That all this western land could have remained untouched by any contact with Asia or Europe or North Africa from the dawn of time until the Columbian voyages just does not seem to make sense. We do recognize the probability that the early Nordic peoples reached the northeast coast of America 
And if we may trust the records in Plutarch's voyages, Greek mariners may have explored the St. Lawrence River. Certainly things did happen. And these things left real and genuine marks upon the way of life in the Western Hemisphere. I have not as yet, quite intentionally, mentioned the Atlantic hypothesis. The possibility that an Atlantic culture may have actually laid the foundation for the civilization of the Americas. There is much to suggest in the legendary and lore of the primordial inhabitants of this continent that they were aware that their culture did not originate here. They have the world deluge myth in common with most other peoples of Asia and Africa. And they have a tendency in their recording to think toward an origin lying to the east of the American continent. This origin does not seem to be fully explained on the possibility of direct contact with Europe. For at any time when this contact would have been reasonable, Europe could not have provided that which these travelers report. So in some way, we feel that a cultural impetus was given to this, con this continent or these western lands at a time long distant. And that at the time of this cultural impetus, it arrived from peoples already themselves cultured. If, for example, such a movement had occurred, ten or twelve thousand years ago, what record do we have anywhere of a civilization that could have equipped the Western peoples for the rise of such cultures as that of the Maya or the Inca? We do not know of any such culture. This would be pre-Egyptian. It would be before the rise of the Greek culture. It would be before, be before anything we know of Chinese culture. It would even probably antedate any reasonable concept we have of Indic culture, which may be the oldest in the world. Thus, from the probable areas from which such contact could be made, there was nothing that would have provided what these people claim to have received. Perhaps then they are justified in assuming that they brought this knowledge from a land or area which has since been submerged and lost to history. But we do not wish to labor this point. Our main problem is to try to understand how certain institutions, almost identical with those of classical antiquity, which arose in the Western world and resulted in the Americas becoming part of a broad world cultural pattern. We know that prior to the Columbian voyages that the peoples of America were not all savage. We know that Cortes, when he saw for the first time the city of Mexico, said that it was the most beautiful city on earth. He called it the Venice of the Western Hemisphere. And he said there was no city in, U in Europe that was its equal. These people, therefore, had advanced far in arts and sciences and were gradually building themselves a solid political situation. This, however, was interrupted and was never permitted uh, to mature. Yet we must also realize that the city of Mexico, with all its grandeur, 
with the Aztec-Toltec culture complex behind it, was relatively uncivilized in comparison to the great empire of the Maya lying further to the south. For if the Aztec peoples uh, were coming into cultural maturity, it was because they had derived their inspiration and their guidance from the more southerly tribes. It is hardly right to think of these people as tribes. They were, they were much more than this. They were nations. Uh, they were not only nations, but they were great social commonwealths. They had good laws. And with that strange directness of spirit, which so often marked uh, these old cultures, uh, they had found remedies for many evils which plague us even today. Many of their laws were wiser and better than our laws. And from what records we can find, particularly in the very marvelous the compilations of Fra Bernardino de Sardun, we know that these laws were kept, that virtues were actually cultivated by the people, that governments for the most part were benevolent. And as Stuart Chase points out, uh, the Central American people hold the world's peace record, a great culture, a great civilization that lived and dwelt and flourished in peace for over 500 years. This uh, situation was no doubt due in part to some kind of relative isolation. By the time the Maya culture had reached its zenith, there seems to have been little evidence that these people were aware of the situations existing in other parts of the world. The three Americas functioned in a strange aloofness. Uh, their cultures developed with comparatively little interruption. They had few of the rugged inducements to intensive competition that we know. Even though some of the tribes were warlike, this warlikeness was very primitive. It was not a highly sophisticated type of warfare. And among the Mayas, if it did arise, it was entirely defensive. And these people were not, by any means or nature, militant. In fact, they were probably one of the most pacifistic of all nations to achieve cultural maturity. Now, when we speak of the great complex of the Maya or Ica culture, the Maya is one of those words that doesn't belong, but which we will never get rid of. This culture was not a, a small thing. It was a great culture. And uh, had it been known earlier to Europe and Asia, probably would have been uh, given precedence over even the cultures of Egypt and Greece in our estimation of human progress. But because it was far away and late of discovery, we have already established ourselves so firmly upon a Greco-Latin civilization that we had no intentions of changing our point of view. In the so-called jungles of Central America, extending from middle Mexico south through the peninsula of Yucatan and down into Central America and almost as far as Panama, there was a great complex of people, a complex that produced a giant bursting of metropolitan centers, great cities, splendid roads, marvelous buildings. Uh, we do not really know the population of that area, but it must have been prodigious. It must have been indeed far greater than we realize. Although we still do not know how these people fed themselves. We do not know how their culture developed so successfully with such a small amount of available soil and water. But in any event, 
there are scattered through these jungles over 200 cities. And one or two of these cities, at least, believe it or not, at areas larger than the city of Los Angeles. And we think we hold the world's record. We do, as of the moment. Public buildings and major edifices in a number of these cities are 30 and 40 miles apart. Great uh, remnants of marvelous uh, plazas, boulevards, and roads bind these things together. In some of these ruins today, and they are only partly excavated, 50 or 100 public buildings of vast size uh, group around some forgotten core of culture. 200 such cities, connected by good highways, roads that lead almost into the United States, and may have at one time extended as far as Montana on the north and the Andes on the south. We cannot truly estimate, but the city of Chichen Itza, on the peninsula of Yucatan, if it was the thriving community that its buildings now indicate, could well have housed three or four million people. Yet all of it is gone. It was gone long before the Spaniards came. Where these people came from, we really do not know. Where they went, we really do not know. We have many interesting and ingenious theories, but these theories do not all add up. And although there are some who are pretty positive in their thinking, the fact really remains that a great culture arose and disappeared. That this culture was not too remote, we also realize, because the Aztecs were in contact with it and they were not a particularly ancient people. But down on the peninsula of Yucatan, we had a civilization that produced great astronomers. His calendar was so good that the Spaniards borrowed it to correct their own. Uh, with great institutions of medicine, a highly socialized state where there was no poverty, a highly benevolent institutional government. Well, while it is said that both the Mayas and the Aztecs had their emperors, and we think of them as monarchies, we should not forget that the emperors were elected, not by heredity. And that when an emperor died, his son did not succeed him. A new emperor was elected. Therefore, we had the beginning of an electional type of government. We also know that these people were highly advanced in hydraulics, that they were splendidly equipped in art, and some of the more recent paintings discovered in the temples of Banampak and among the ruins of the old Lacandone culture would indicate that these paintings and sculpturings might well have arisen in Western Asia, perhaps even in Japan. All these mysteries finally center around the, pre the supreme mystery in the life of the people. That is the mystery of its religion. Every great culture that has ever arisen has had to have a great spiritual impetus behind it. We have no trace or track of the what might be termed indigenous religion of a primitive Amerindian. We do not know of any such religion. From the records in Central America such as have been preserved, Everything points to the fact that the faiths of all these peoples were imported doctrines. They came from elsewhere. In the uh, great Maya culture area, which was the most advanced of the three, three names stand out as representing the great religious leaders. The first and most important of all these, of course, was Itzamna, the father of the Itzas, of the mysterious patriarch who, like a second Noah, 
led his people across the oceans in ships to the peninsula of Yucatan to escape some deluge that destroyed the ancient islands of mud. Zanna is pictured in the arts of his people as an old man, either toothless or with a single crooked fang, with a large and disproportionately shaped nose. He was the son of Hunab Ku, Lord of the Sky, was believed to have been immaculately conceived, and he brought his people not only out of another land into safety, but established among them the basic principles of their religion. He was their enlightener. He was the great teacher of these people. The second name that arises in this complex of culture is the name of Votan. Uh, Votan, founder of the Votanic culture, empire, Palanque, is again a mysterious god. He also <laughs> came from beyond the sea, from another world. He was immaculately conceived. He was wise. And when he established the great temple town, town of Palanque, he built there the house of darkness, where the secrets and records of his people and their origin. All these uh, important details are said to have been properly preserved. This was also the same Votan who was called later the Navigating Serpent, because it was believed that in a ship he actually made the journey to the Mediterranean, visited the Temple of Solomon, and saw the ruins of the Tower of Babel. This all belongs to culture legends, but some of them we do not really feel inclined to entirely disregard. The third and probably the best known of these culture leaders of this area was Kukulkan, the feathered serpent. He was born of the morning star, conceived of a virgin. He came from a mysterious land far away, the land of the seven colors. And he came and he brought to his people the blessings of wisdom and civilization. He was their great hero. And the totemic mask of Kukulkan is still one of the most sacred emblems to be found among the ruins of these ancient civilizations. Under other names, either as Gukomat or later as Quetzalcoatl, this deity of the feathered serpent was venerated throughout Mexico and up into the southern tribe of the United States. Here were the great culture heroes, the founders of the mysteries. We know that the, the peoples of this region celebrated religious rites. We know that the Spaniards, when they first came here, were horrified by these rites. Not horrified because the rites were sanguine or terrible, but horrified because it appeared to them that these people were worshipping or practicing a false Christianity. This record is very clearly noted. And one of the reasons we are so impoverished at this time is because of the wholesale destruction of the manuscripts and books of these people by the early missionaries. Uh, these missionaries were insulted and probably quite piously disturbed by the fact that a so-called heathen, uncultured people could have such a religion. You can imagine what a missionary would feel like if he asked one of these Indians in their strange uh, defeatheredness what he believed. And this Indian replied, as one of them did, he said, I believe in one God manifesting through three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Yet these Indians hadn't learned this from Spaniards. 
The only answer the Spaniards could think of was that the devil had been working overtime. Only an infernal power could have caused these strange and distant peoples to have religious rites so similar to their own. For they learned that the son of the great god Bacab, the one and only begotten, had died for his people, had atoned with his own blood for their sins, and that even now the remnants, and there are not many, of the Lacandones still celebrate the Eucharist of the blood of the martyred God. The answer is pretty evident. There had to have been a tremendous culture platform underneath this people. One of the sources of our knowledge of these peoples and their uh, mysteries are the Chilambalam, the sacred books of the head men of the villages. The great Chilambalam of Cozumel was for many years stored in the library at Merida, but after one of our enthusiastic archaeological teams passed through the area, the book disappeared and has never been seen again. Uh, in polite language, it was simply stolen. But in these books, which contain the record of the antiquity of the people, of their laws, of their morals, of their ethics, uh, we know that we are dealing with a great culture and a highly advanced one. Uh, there are a number of interesting and sometimes amusing names that have been bestowed upon the buildings and the various ruined complexes of Central America. Uh, at, for, at, for example, at Chichen Itza, there is a building called the Nunnery, undoubtedly so called because there never were any nuns near it. Uh, this building, which was just named because it looked like an, an old-fashioned European monastery or nunnery to some degree, uh, has near it the only three-story building found in that particular complex. And on the end of that building is another little building called the chapel, or an ecclesia. And over the door of this sits the great God of heaven, seated like the Orphic deity in the luminous egg, adorned with the plumes of the Quetzal bird, surrounded by the radiance of eternal light. This mysterious being is the heaven one, the one great God, represented as the Hindus did their, their Brahma, seated or standing in an egg. This deity has never been explained. Everyone who has tried to study this philosophy and these ideas has been blocked by the lack of evidence, by the lack of continuity of thought and the fact that nearly everything we do have has been filtered through the Spaniards, which did no particular credit to the Indians by intention, and a lot of discredit to the Spaniards by consequence. The few good Spanish recorders came too late, and the whole subject is locked in, a, in an in, almost impenetrable darkness. Arushmal, we also have the same mystery. Over the city rises the great pyramid temple of Adivino, the house of the dwarf. What it really was, we do not know. There is also a little building, little in what we see, uh, which is called the dovecot. So named because of the curious open work uh, of the front elevation of the building. But what interests us, uh, uh, interests us is that the front wall is over 2,000 feet from the back wall. So we had a, quite a building when it was in good condition. Most of these buildings stood upon great artificial pyramids. And the impressiveness of the structures um, touches us even when we look upon their present ruins. So out of what we have, I made quite a careful study to do what we could with this subject, 
from the available codices, which are not too numerous, and from some of the earlier uh, Western students, European students, like Lord Kingsborough, who are called visionaries, and from the probings and wanderings of men like Dr. Laponjon, who uh, is considered a little mad, out of all of these things put together, we try to piece uh, into some kind of pattern the story of what the religion and belief of these people might have been and how their religions were celebrated. Everywhere the serpent appears, the serpent which has been connected with religious worship all over the world, whether it be the Nagas of India or Cambodia, whether it be the winged seraphs of the Mongolian desert, or the serpents of the Egyptian glyphs, or the ancient serpents of the priestesses of the mysteries of Samothrace, everywhere the serpent coils out of the case that holds the book. And we find it so represented on the early coinage of the Greek states. The serpent to these people certainly represented wisdom. The winged serpent, which was almost the dragon, was their emblem of adeptship, or of a secret initiation into the mysteries. Their guardian spirits and angel, their mysterious defender, was the Quetzal bird, itself, again, a form of the phoenix. So out of the uh, mysteries of these people come the same symbols that were used in other nations to convey the idea of initiation into the mysteries. The temples of these people, like those of Asia and the Near East, were nearly always subterranean to represent the serpent's hold. Those who went down through the mysterious passageways passed through again the same harrowing experiences that are recorded on the other side of the earth. The only book that we have now that really gives us some little consolation and insight into the mysteries of these people is the Popol Vuh. So this is the mysterious sacred book of the Kichi. And in this we have a complete story of initiation ritual. We then also begin to suspect the reason for some of the strange buildings that exist in this area. For there are certainly isolated structures far away from the general concourse of the people. Why one or two vast temples should arise by themselves in the wet jungle of Palanque or the dry jungle of Yucatan, we do not know. But somewhere amidst the barrenness of a most unhospitable region, you will see the gaunt bones of a great house something that must in its glory when it was covered with the bright pigmentation uh, that ornamented the elaborate and intricate stuccoed designs. These buildings must have been things of extraordinary beauty. But why were they there? I think the Popol Vuh tells us that part of the training and the upbringing of the young warrior or the young citizen was that he had to make a journey, the mysterious journey that the initiates of all mysteries throughout the world have taken. He had to journey into the wilderness and there go to one of the great shrines or sanctuaries of his people. Apparently in this uh, region the tendency was for the university temples to be isolated rather than to stand in the midst of cities. Now what these temples really were, perhaps we can gather from comparison with the Egyptian. A number of scholars have sensed that there was some parallel between the Maya situation and the doctrines and philosophies of Egypt, and a number of identical symbols have been found in the languages of both these people, the written languages, with the same meanings. Therefore, there is some hope 
uh, in the idea that there was a connection here at a remote time. In any event, the truth seeker went forth to prove himself. Uh, the same situation occurs on a less elaborate level among the North American Indian tribes, where it was the duty of the young man to go into the forest or into the wilderness and perform vigil uh, for the attainment of his manhood, and in, in order that he might, uh, in dream or vision, receive uh, the name or identity of his totem or his guardian spirit. Now, of course, in the North American area, the civilization had not sufficiently developed so that institutional mysteries could exist. But in these Latin American regions, these did exist. So the young man went out in search of truth. He went out to become an initiate in his own right, to be worthy to bear the insignia of the serpent and also to have hovering over him the protecting wings of the bird of paradise. What happened when he reached these priestly temples? We are not too sure. Even the Popol Vuh does not tell us too much. But there is the suspicion that they represented much the same thing as the priestly institutions of Egypt. Here, in all probabilities, uh, the a neophyte was accepted into the lore and legendary of his tribe. He sat with the wise ones. He sat with those who were learned. He sat with those who knew the stories of old things, and probably also with the professors of such arts and sciences as flourished in his day. I think we can safely say that higher education, as it was known to these people, was acquired through these princely or priestly institutions. It is quite possible, however, that the simple forms of knowledge were communicated in the communities themselves. And we are now dealing with a people that had a splendid and very complex written language, more difficult to interpret than the Chinese and sufficiently subtle so that any type of scientific, literary, or poetic work could be adequately composed in it. We had a great language. More than five to six thousand of its characters have already been identified, although not uh, understood. So it was probably the higher knowledge, the knowledge of those things closest to the hearts and souls of men, uh, that came through these priestly institutions. Uh, from the ends, uh, from one end of this culture to the other, uh, we know that these people believed definitely that certain persons from among their tribes possessed supernatural powers. Wherever we have this legend of prophets or patriarchs, of ancient sages who could raise the dead and heal the sick, who had powers to stop the winds and quell the storms, had powers to see into the hearts of men and to gaze into mirrors of obsidian and read the minds of peoples at a great distance. Wherever such legends gather, we are suspicious that we are in the presence of some kind of a hierarchy which taught secret arts. We cannot assume that this type of knowledge not only came into existence, but was accepted as a symbol of authority and virtue. We cannot assume this to happen unless such institutions exist. For where supernatural powers appear among uncultured peoples, they are held in fear and disregard and the performers of them are supposed to be witches or sorcerers. This is not the case, however, if the whole nation understands that these represent superior attributes, as in Egypt and Greece. So these people undoubtedly did have secret arts, and did practice them, and were instructed in them, and these have always been part of religion. 
So in the mysteries of Habalba, practiced or described in the Popol Vuh uh, as taking place in a remote and mysterious temple in the wilderness, we are certainly in the presence of one of these initiation systems. In this particular rite, the usual circumstances are unfolded. The candidates for initiation pass through horrible experiences. They are tested. It appears that they cannot survive. They must fight against monsters. They must disentangle their minds from witchcraft and sorcery. Uh, they must remain true to their principles and hold their courage against the most terrible temptations. And finally, having gone through experiences as fantastic as anything described in the Arabian Nights Entertainment, which incidentally is a similar kind of work, these candidates accepted finally into the temple as having proved themselves, their characters and their resolutions, were then feasted, brought into the presence of a blessed spectacle, were given honor and recognition and uh, were safely rescued from all their difficulties. In other words, it is the typical story of man journeying through the underworld of ignorance in search of light and finding this light uh, by means of an organized institution, a priestly school in which the secrets of the soul were communicated to those entitled to receive them. That such institutions existed throughout the Mayan complex, we know. We know also that from the records of these people, that their legends and their lore remind us much of the legends of the prophets of ancient Israel and other parallel culture groups. Lord Kingsborough was of the opinion that some uh, early Christian apostles or evangelists must have reached the Western Hemisphere in the first century and have been responsible for some of these uh, beliefs. And he even suspects that Quetzalcoatl, the savior god of Mexico, who is described as a fair person, mitered and wearing a robe adorned with crosses, might possibly have been one of the apostles uh, who went forth perhaps for some entirely different region, but was cast by adverse conditions upon the shore of the Western Hemisphere. Uh, that such a thing could have occurred is possible, for up to the present time we have no accurate report on the lives of six or seven of the twelve original apostles. So we don't know too much about this. Anything might be possible. If St. Thomas reached India, why could not some other early saint have reached the Western Hemisphere? It is also possible that it would have been feasible for some Christian who had reached deep Asia to make the journey to the Western world. It is known that the Chinese reached the coast of California sometime in about 300 B.C., bringing with them certain plant life and other uh, living forms which are not to be found here, and leaving several engraved stones along our seaboard, some of which are still in existence. But in any event, from the Popol Vuh and from the remaining mysteries that have been preserved in sculpturing and in early transcriptions derived from the Christianized Indians under Spanish supervision, the pageantry unfolds pretty systematically, and we can come to only one broad conclusion, which, however, we cannot entirely fill in, and that is that sacred rites, similar to those of Egypt and India, Greece and Rome, were celebrated here for the same reasons and under almost the same symbols, and with a similar insight into the essential meaning of human consciousness and the mysteries of human life. A number of the old Aztec manuscripts which have survived are cosmological, showing the construction of the universe. And most of these cosmological uh, documents are rather parallel to the old Chaldean beliefs relating to these things. 
In fact, a number of students of North American Indian philosophy have declared that the Indian cosmos, the Indian concept of the universe, throughout the eastern part of the United States and even into the Western Plains Indians, that this general concept is de definitely Babylonian and can be almost traced in the monuments of Assyria and Persia and other uh, similar areas. Now with this thinking, we can turn from the Maya, which certainly possessed the highest form of this culture, to a brief uh, thought concerning the Aztec to further to the north. We know that the Aztec was the spiritual child of the Maya. Uh, the Aztec had not yet developed a full written language, but was moving toward it very rapidly at the time of the conquest. Uh, the Aztec was a more warlike, uh, more sanguine temperament than the Maya. He was a more aggressive man by nature. Uh, but even with all this aggressiveness, he had a certain sense of honor and a certain integrity. And I think that the so-called savagery of these people has been largely exaggerated by the Spaniards, who insisted on finding some justification for trying to exterminate them. Actually, if the truth were known, these people had many uh, good points, although it is possible that like many other peoples who are in a semi-savage state, that they practice certain destructive excesses. But their religious system was founded again upon the cult of Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent. Uh, we know that their morality among their own people was excellent. We know that they had good laws and that they administered them justly. We also know that their rulers were also priests that it was a theocratic state, uh, that they surrounded themselves with philosophers, scholars, uh, mystics, psychics, astrologers, and others of similar caliber, and that the government was administered in harmony with the spiritual leadership which, di which governed and directed the people. We know also from contemporary records that these seers and astrologers accurately predicted the coming of the Spaniards long before they arrived and warned the Emperor of Mexico to prepare himself. But the Mexicans had really no way of preparing themselves because they had no idea whatever uh, as to the uh, propensities of the stranger. They were not prepared to defend themselves against him. They had nothing to compare to his horse or his gun. And it is said that the Western Hemisphere was uh, captured or was uh, finally conquered by a horse and a blunderbuss. These things the Indians could not cope with. But in any event, these Indians in the northern regions likewise had a religion that was essentially morally just. They had a belief in this deity, Quetzalcoatl, they believed him to be a master artisan. And if they, uh, if they had a cult that can be paralleled to anything that we know of in the old world, perhaps it would be paralleled to the Dionysian artificers of the Greeks. The cult of Quetzalcoatl was the cult of the artificers. He was represented most anciently in a long robe. He was a master of workmen. He carried with him the power to melt and uh, work metals. He was a master architect. He could prepare and design buildings. He was indeed a kind of combination of the Greek artificer and the medieval European guildmaster. It is said even by the Spaniards that the men who brought with him belonged to a guild and that these, that these guildsmen uh, were the ones that introduced into this area the making of fine jewels, uh, the making of beautiful ornaments, the casting of metals for the adornment of temples and palaces, 
and for the adornment of persons. But these same ones also built all kinds of devices, instruments, and machines, that they were skilled in invention, and that under their tutelage these people learned how uh, to build cities, uh, to bring water to them, to create sewerage, to orient their buildings, uh, to achieve the penetration of light into the inner rooms of a building uh, through careful reflection of light from slanted walls, that they were able to drain their buildings so that a cup of water placed on the top of the most complicated edifice would ultimately drain to the ground. All of these things showed a highly advanced skill. Where did this man come from? Where did this singing band of workmen come from? who came all the way down to Chululak, who came singing down the countryside in a great procession, led by this magnificent man leaning on his staff, this man who wore the apron of a stonemason or something of that nature. This would be a golden holiday for students of early Freemasonic tradition because it seems as though something of this nature must be indicated. In the complexes of buildings in Central America and also in Mexico, Masonic aprons, both square and triangular, are noted. And the great mystical symbol of the red hand is to be found upon these buildings. A red hand which also appears almost identically upon the ruins of Angkor Wat in Cambodia. It is easy enough to toss these thoughts into discard but it is not very easy to work out an answer that is big enough to take them all in. Yet this has to happen sometime or we will never come to the end of our riddle. We do not actually know also whether under the heading of Kukulkan, the feathered serpent, or Gukomat, that means the same, or Quetzalcoatl, which has the same meaning, whether we are dealing with one person or more than one person. The Mexican archaeologists, and also a good many of the German ones, are now inclined to think that this term, the feathered serpent, might have the same generic significance as the term Zoroaster in Persia. There were at least nine Zoroasters living at widely different times whose lives were mingled into one story. There were probably five persons who have been combined to make the story of Orpheus that we now have in the Greek. There were probably five persons by the name of Orpheus, whose name simply means, by the way, the Dark One, who finally mingled their stories and their adventures to make the one Orphic fable we know. It is quite conceivable that the story of Quetzalcoatl is not the story of one man alone, but the story of a culture hero, a hero that was reborn again and again, it is quite possible that a person attaining to a certain degree of exaltation, perhaps the hierophant of the mysteries, assumed the name and became the living exponent of the original doctrine. And just as one after another the popes of Rome took upon themselves the title Pontifex Maximus, so it is quite possible that in these central Indian areas a traditional descent of leaders all took the totem of, of, of Quetzalcoatl, or the symbol of the feathered serpent, to themselves. In any event, when we go into the this, uh, area around Mexico City, particularly at the pyramids of the sun and moon at San, at San Juan Teotihuacan, the uh, monuments there would imply uh, a greater antiquity than we are inclined to assume. Uh, the American archaeologists say they were built about 1,200, 1,500 years ago. German archaeologists think they were built three or 4,000 years ago. And some of the Mexican archaeologists I have talked to about it shrug their shoulders in typical Latin manner and say, well, maybe 6,000, maybe 8,000 years, who knows? So the situation here is not exactly clear either. The old records of the Mexican people, like the records of the Egyptians about their pyramids, are fairly concise, however. 
the earliest records of the Mexicans imply that these were already prehistoric and forgotten monuments. No one knows who built them. In the earliest mentions of these pyramids, it is said that God made them. In the earliest mentions of the Egyptian pyramids, they were the tombs of gods. So their actual age is hard to say. Perhaps they were long before the coming of even the hypothetical and extremely mysterious Toltecs. In any event, these buildings stood. And some of the older mazes perhaps also had the ornaments and symbols of the feathered serpent. One of these symbols was smuggled out of Mexico not too long ago after being stolen from one of these temples and offered for sale here in the United States. It was a figure of Quetzalcoatl, supposedly from one of the pyramids of the San Juan complex. So it's possible that we are dealing with a combination of factors, that this deity represents uh, an archetypal uh, concept of God, that this deity became embodied through his sons, and that it is sent of great teachers, great initiate priests, even great princely rulers of those ages, like the Osirian rulership of prehistoric Egypt, that these have had the same names, that they have descended, that their lives and numerous activities have been confused, and that is why, even in attempting to piece the lives of these men together, we find so many inconsistencies. There may have well have been more than one. If so, we are inclined to assume that they were correct, when uh, they claimed that it was this Quetzalcoatl, or at least one of them, who seated in a cave with the great Earth Mother, revealed the Tonalamatl, or the mysterious, mysterious calendar, which gave them the Sun-Venus system of reckoning. For it is true in this calendar, the calendar of Central America, that you can identify correctly any day of any year for hundreds of thousands of years with almost no difficulty whatsoever through a series of interlocking calendar devices. We have had never developed anything like it in our culture, whatever. It is again attributed to the god of the feathered serpent. All these things point to part of this initiate culture. But these people may very well have drifted north, or they may also have resulted from people drifting south from a more northerly region. And I have always felt that if we wanted to understand the true position or the true religion of these mysteries of Central America, that we would do very well to examine the rather shallower remains of our North American tribes. For it is very possibly here that we would see the archetypal devices we would see the original patterns. Now, there are two ways in which we can approach this. One is to suspect that these migrants wandering from the north downward left some of their tribes behind, some of their wanderers perhaps did not wish to make the long journey, broke off and did not become part of a parent culture, remained comparatively primitive and provided the wandering tribes of our North American uh, Amerindian group. Or it is possible that stragglers or persons seeking colonization opportunities at a remote time broke away from the southern culture and came up here to Malaysian Polynesian culture. In any event, what is the problem with our North American Indians? Here we have a wide diversity of cultural attainment. Here we have also the indication that on this continent there was a gradual developing of a religious unity. Uh, the religious instincts of the North American Indians are surprisingly pure. Although these people were divided into comparatively small culture groups and that they had almost no contact outside of their own clans, these people developed in, inherently within their nature the most dignified, 
simple but solemn concepts of religious value. In the entire American Indian complex, there emerges the archetypal, primordial, and inevitable priesthood. And this priesthood is a little difficult for us to restore from our own thinking because of poor terminology, which afflicts us here very seriously also. The religious leader of the American Indian tribe we call the medicine man. It is a miserable term with no meaning that is uh, comparable uh, to the importance of his position. Uh, he was not uh, one of these Indians that wandered around uh, under servitude to some white vendor of patent medicine. Uh, the American Indian medicine priest, uh, or whatever we want to call him, uh, and anything we really call him, no one will know what we mean unless we say medicine priest, uh, was actually a holy man. He was a saint. He was the hierarchy, he was the agent of deity upon earth for the small world in which he lived. For some reason, nearly all American Indian culture groups divided themselves into three orders, a pattern still followed in the caravans that go across the desert of Mongolia. The moment a caravan is formed, it elects three leaders. In every American Indian tribe, there were three leaders. Uh, one was the overchief, uh, the supreme ruler of the tribe. The second was the war chief, who had to do with the protecting of the people against their enemies and against the emergency uh, of hazardous events and circumstances. And the third was the medicine chief. And the medicine chief was the priest who counseled. And it was rare indeed that a war chief or even the supreme chief of a tribe would make any important action without consulting the medicine priest. We know, for example, that when we see a Christian priest of the older days and his full canonical, we find him robed. We find him, therefore, wearing, as was customary among most religions, uh, the androgen garments of both man and woman. Uh, in other words, the priests wore skirted vestments, and still in their robes they wear garments that resemble a feminine attire. The American Indian medicine priests did the same thing. They said among those tribes that the reason for this was that he must be distinguished from other persons, so that if by a chance, a chance the tribe was attacked by an enemy, the enemy would not accidentally kill the priest. He was supposed to be inviolate. He was not a warrior. He could never carry on. But his counsel was considered to be as important to the vanquished and the vanquished, the vanquished, uh, the victor, and he must not be injured in any combat. To do anything to him is, would be to bring down the wrath of heaven. The medicine priest, therefore, lived in a universe consisting, as he himself expresses it, and I have talked to several about it, I have known medicine priests, I have discussed their philosophy with them. And it is very simple. Uh, the universe is divided into three parts, corresponding to heaven, earth, and hell. This they knew long before any white man came here. The three regions of Chaldea, Babylon, and of the ancient Jewish writers. The upper supreme region, the overworld, was the abode of the Manigos, the great spirit. And who were the great spirit, the rulers of the world? The, the great spirit were the council of the eternal father. So over all people, or over all the world, there must finally be one father. And these Indians did not worship a, po a polytheistic concept essentially. They did not worship many gods any more than the Brahmin or the Buddhist does. 
They worship attributes. They worship beings who personified or exemplified various aspects of the supreme deity. This supreme deity they did not know, they did not understand. They admitted this. They could not know this deity according to its essence. They could only know it according to its manifestation. And the primary manifestations of this deity were other, uh, were other deities, uh, which had control over the sky and the stars and the sun and the moon. Therefore, these became the symbols of the supreme invisible cause of all life. Here also, somewhere far above the heaven, in some mysterious abode, was the great medicine lodge. And as you listen to an old Plains Indian telling you about the great medicine lodge, you cannot help but think of the mysterious legends of the, of the Gobi of Desert of Mongolia and of the Temple of Shambhala that rises in the midst of the everlasting sun. The medicine lodge of the Indian is the seat of universal government. The medicine lodge is the place where the elders, the great ones, the man of those who serve the eternal, sat in solemn council around the council fire. And each one smoked the calumet, or the pipe of peace, and the altar of uh, incense unto the Most High. And here these grave and ancient ones uh, labored forever, uh, that their children upon the earth might be led in righteousness and virtue. And it was the Indian that I, one Indian that I talked to, uh, and she explained it to me, uh, smiled and said, of course we realize that this great medicine lodge and these great gods and this great father who is beyond all, that these we, we do not belong to us. They're not just Indians. This is the government of the whole world. We, we explain it for our own people that the Great One who sits above the Manados, who is the invisible presence in the, around the council fire, he is not any more Indian than he is anything else. He is life. He is the Great One. And wherever people are, anywhere on earth, he is also their same father. You know, he got around to something we haven't caught up to yet. Namely, that all these things really are names for something that is universal. And out somewhere in the windy Dakotas, they realize this. But in the great cities of our churches, they do not know it yet. Perhaps the Dakotas give better air. And this heaven world is then guarded by a great being. And this great being is the Thunderbird. You see it. He is a kind of winged creature, perhaps like the cherubs that guarded the gates of Solomon's house. And this thunderbird is the messenger. And every time he flashes his eyes, there is lightning. And when he rubs his great wings together, there is thunder. This is the mysterious messenger between heaven and earth. This is the phoenix the symbol of the regenerated human soul, the, the symbol of the truth in man, which is the bridge between earth and heaven. The second region of these Indians, below the sky, is the great expanse of nature itself. Here is the human world. Here is the earth that has been given to man, as old Chief Seattle said. We are the creatures who have been given the right to make this world beautiful. And most of all, as the Indian says, we have the right to leave this world as good as we found it. And we shall do no evil to it. We shall never injure it. We shall never exploit it. We shall not tear down it trees or corrupt its earth, we will not pollute its waters or its air. We will keep them pure for those who come after us. 
because of those who came before us had not kept them pure, we could not live here today. So to keep this good earth pure is very important, and to realize that it was large enough for many tribes, for many herds of buffalo, so that all men might have enough, but never large enough for any man to waste anything. Never to kill for sport, never to injure for intent, but always to use wisely and lovingly, and if we must take life, to pray for that life, that it will forgive us for what we have had to do. Always thoughtfulness, always care, always prayer, always song to the sunrise, and always the strong song that is sung by the brave man when his time comes to die. This is the simple morality of a powerful culture group, a great people. And it was worked out upon the broad plain of the earth with its mountains and its valleys. And if there was a sacred place somewhere on this earth that corresponds to the Eastern concepts of in some sacred island in the Gobina, this in the West was the place of the Red Stone Pipe Quarry. Here it was that the pipe stem was quarried by all the tribes in order that they might make the pipe of peace, which is the symbol of their altar. And no matter how much war there might be among tribes or how evil men guarded or discarded each other, they must always enter into the place of the pipe quarry in brotherhood. For this was the place that the great spirit had set aside for men to make the symbols of their religion. And these must be guarded and served always with respect and fraternity. In the presence of their, of their God, no man could raise their arms in violence. Then below the earth to live another world. A strange world that the Indian did not understand very well. But to him this underworld was not a place of punishment. The Indian had no place of punishment. I asked an Indian once why he didn't believe that there was a hell or a place of punishment, as the missionary said. He smiled very frankly and said, I don't think that we deserve to go to such a place. Therefore, why should we imagine that there is one? All Indians are good. Therefore, they don't worry about people. It might be a little oversimplification, but it is, it is still a pleasant thinking. Whereas in our way of life, nearly everyone either goes there or is sent there by somebody else. <laughs> in fact, I have been told by unfair authorities that all the best people are there. But this other world to the Indian seems to be a sort of subterranean laboratory. For it is here that the grasses learn to grow. It is here that the great salt mother lives. It is under the earth that the spirit lives who must make things to be green and the flowers to blossom. Uh, the Indian's afterworld is not really under the earth for the most part. It is in a kind of shadow twilight, somewhere between the earth and the sky. And the stars are the campfires of the, of the brave warriors who have gone before. But they still have this idea of three worlds. A world of things beneath, where little creatures live, and where the earth mother dwelt, Mother Nature herself. And the servant of the earth mother was the serpent, because the serpent went, went down into its hole in the ground and whispered to the earth mother the messages of men. So the serpent is the messenger to the earth, and the phoenix is the messenger to the sky. Of course, the phoenix is called the thunderbird. Now we have a threefold universe, and over this universe, great powers forever ruling. This is the same universe that we have in other parts of the world. Now, how were the initiations with the earth? Uh, thought of or practiced in these times. We may divide our American Aboriginal people into about three broad groups for our present purposes. Let's not forget there were many languages and probably 
nearly 200 essential cultural groups north of the uh, Mexican border here in this country. But for general purposes, we can divide them into about three. One was the Plains Indians, a completely nomadic people. Uh, they were a strong, vigorous people because they were constantly moving. Therefore, they never had to live with their own refuge, which became the basis of sickness among practically all ancient peoples. The moment they become uh, stationary, the moment they settle into some abode, uh, there are problems which the primitive mind could not cope with. And we also then have a lessening of vitality among the people. So the Plains Indians were among the most active and robust of our Indians. Then along the eastern seaboard, we had uh, those Indians that had become involved in the great league of the Iroquois nation and were what we might almost call civilized Indians. Civilized in the sense that they already had practically all of the basic principles of self-government, of education, of commerce, of social equity, and things of that nature before the coming of the white man. Then we have in our southwest uh, areas the Pueblo Indian or the house dwelling Indian that formed comparatively permanent habitation and began to develop a much more intense social culture, particularly involving in problems of marriage across the Pueblo and things of that nature. Uh, in the um, Plains Indians, the religious rituals were either part of the daily life of the people, or as in the case of the Midi uh, and of the Ojibwe nation, temporary structures used for religious purposes, similar to the tabernacle in the wilderness used for the Jewish people. Uh, your Eastern Indian had his long house in which his entire religious and political philosophy could be evolved and uh, already had reached the point where the long house had become a kind of free university and the youth of all the tribes uh, shared in certain educational adventures in connection with learning the citizenship of their tribe. Uh, in the Pueblo Indian areas, the culture developed very rapidly, and in the average Pueblo, a number of secret societies formally came into existence. These secret societies pertain to many subjects, of which perhaps the most important might be the fertility society, the war society, uh, the um, societies which had to do with healing and medicine, and the societies which had to do with hunting. These were the ones that perhaps uh, were the most versatile, and there were also, in most instances, one or more of these borderline societies which had already begun to intimidate and had begun to use what was termed magic for various objectionable ends. So that uh, there was nearly always a society among these troubles regarded with fear by the other uh, medicine or culture groups. Uh, these societies were certainly secret orders. And we know from the uh, mysterious rituals involved in the snake dance and in other of the magical rituals, as Dr. Loomis pointed out, miracles of many kinds, things that would be equal to anything attributed to a Hindu uh, magician, were performed in the kivas and in the holy places of these medicine societies. The priests were able to make uh, the sun shine at midnight. Uh, they were able to levitate rocks. Uh, they were able to reproduce all kinds of phenomena, thunderstorms, and things of that nature within the structure of their lodge. And their dancing feather ceremonies are well known. Even today, uh, in some of the in the whole reservation, you can see the dancing feather ceremony. The magic was involved in most of the ritualism of these societies. Also, the great medicine societies performing the rituals such as the Yobachai or the great uh, uh, chant, medicine chant, feeding chant, the deer chant, the use of the sand painting, 
uh, the development of the coast of the Katsina, or the little gods that come down from the mountain, all of these things we find fairly well developed, particularly in the areas where the community-dwelling pueblos meet the remnants of the old uh, southwestern plains Indians. In substance, we have much evidence of the religious ritual, and we have almost all of the basic values involved in uh, the initiation rites of ancient times. Uh, throughout the world, whether it be Greece or Rome, Egypt, India, or America, the initiation rites originally involved citizenship in the tribe, the nation, or the community. This citizenship had to be won by both boys and girls. And in most of the primitive ritualistic societies, uh, both the boys and girls were initiated or had their own society to carry them from childhood to maturity. Each uh, group was instructed in the responsibilities of manhood or womanhood and initiated into a great deal of traditional knowledge that would be useful and necessary, and perhaps most of all initiated into a way of life in harmony with the teachings that had descended to them orally from their ancestors or from the spirit. American Indian religion did involve a great deal of spiritism, a great deal of communion with nature, with a listening to the voices of the old and the trees and those who had gone before. The Indian did his vigil on every emergency of life. And each of these vigil experiences was like a small rite of, in of initiation. The principal rite, however, depended for its performance upon circumstances. The lodge could either be built as the meeting was built, with its three rooms and its journey from west to east, with its hazards, with its symbols, and with its final communication of esoteric instruction and the bestowal of citizenship. Also, in this case, the bestowal of the medicine mystery by which the person became, theoretically at least, capable of leading his life from his own soul. The Indian way of life was, as one has expressed it, a leading from within. He lived, for the most part, more or less isolated. He had very little contact with any except his own tribe. His entire solution to every emergency that arose had to be from within. So the whole religious mystery of the American Indian and of the Central American Indian also, in a more uh, sophisticated manner, was this development of the leadership from within. Some of these Indians definitely did use narcotic herbs to create trances and dreams, and the ghost church cult, hypnosis, was introduced, and in many other groups, magnetism, spiritism, and other beliefs and doctrines which we attribute to Europe or to other parts of the world were in use at a very early time. These forms of knowledge seemingly were innate. They were something that came to people as they grew or unfolded. They did not have to receive them by direct transmission from someone else, but perhaps they could have. This is the point that is still very difficult to clarify. So the uh, Plains Indian that had no special medicine house, uh, that had perhaps no cultural tradition to build one, uh, simply permitted uh, the true speaker to go out into the wilderness and pray. This perhaps is the oldest church of God that we know, through prayer and fasting. And he went out and he, uh, and he created his little circle of prayer sticks, and he lit his pipe, and he burned it to the four corners of the world, and he seated himself upon the good earth, and sat almost in a Buddha-like posture, and there simply waited with his hands loosely in his lap, his eyes nearly closed, his head bent, sitting alone under the stars, 
waiting to hear the voice of his God. And his prayer was always the same, Father, show me the way. And he would listen, and perhaps he would hear nothing. But if he did not, he would continue his vigil, day after day, night after night. He would fast and pray, and though sometimes he collapsed with exhaustion. Perhaps it was only then that the vision came. But those who uh, seemingly were more quick of vision often saw or heard almost immediately. And they lived and they accepted. Whatever they heard, that they did. There was no question, no debate, no self-interest to impose itself. Whatever was whispered to them out of the night, that they did. With a full heart and a complete confidence. One of the great medicine priests of the Ojibwe nation once uh, described how he learned to be a healer. He admitted very definitely that this office of medicine chief was hereditary to a degree, but very often there was no one to carry it on. Uh, there was no schooling in it. Perhaps a young man observed the common remedies of his tribe, or watched the medicine priest at work, or learned some of the songs, or tried to uh, copy some of the remedies, but there was no formal instruction. If you went out into the night and sat alone, then the time came for you to do the vigil of manhood, which was to tell you what you were to do with your life. You had to be guided by vision. No Indian would ever decide what his career is going to be, and nor would his relatives and friends. No one would say, my son is going to be a medicine priest, and perhaps uh, do everything possible by conspiracy to make this possible. Such a thing was not done among these people. A young man went out. If he was a very thoughtful, quiet, mystic type of young man, it might be rumored among the tribe that he probably would be a priest, but this was only if the gods finally thanked him. And when he went out and did his vigil alone, he waited for the spirit to come and tell him. And if he beheld in his vigil, vigil the form of a thunderbird, if the thunderbird appeared to him with its great glistening eyes and its thundering wings, he knew then that he was ordained to be a priest, for he was under the wing of the great bird of heaven. If such was the case, then it was his task now to become a healer of his people. He couldn't go to school. There was no college, no American Medical Association, to which we all give thanks, and there was nothing of his kind to help him. He didn't even know one weed from another. All he knew was that heaven had intended that he become a healer. Therefore, it was heaven that must show him the way. And as this man explained to me, he began, and various people came to him, and they were sick, and the old medicine priest had died, and he had naturally uh, become his successor. He had never studied with him, but he had respected him. And so a man came and said, I have a great pain in my side, what shall I do? Another one said, I have a tooth that hurts. The third says, I have an abscess. A fourth has broken his leg in a fall from a horse. Another one has been injured fighting a bear. Another has been stung by a serpent. All of these people come one after the other through the years. The sick, the old, the infant, the mother to bear her child. Everything comes to the old medicine tree. And he has never been to school and he's never had a lesson in anything. What can he do? As this one told me, there's only one thing you can do. Pray. Be silent. Hold out your hands to the sky and tell the sky to use them. We cannot use them. And he said, always when I pray, something comes. Always a voice seems to lead me. Always my eye turns to something. I am shown the way. So I go out and I look for an herb. And I cannot tell one herb from another. 
because I sit there quietly looking over the land, and I say, Father, show me the herbs that will bring help. And he says, as I watch, a light shines from that herb, and I go and get it, and I make the medicine, and the person gets well. This is the beginning. This is the way I think that probably all arts and sciences began. A very primitive searching in which man, because he possessed a peculiar kind of consciousness, was able by degrees uh, to reveal to himself and to himself to others the innumerable mysteries of life as these mysteries unfold. So the medicine priest received his initiation out alone in vigil. He received it every day as he labored. And he lived always in this great lodge of heaven itself. Schoolcraft, in his great work on the American Indian, describes how some of these medicine priests, in their vision, actually believed that they were able to leave their bodies and go to the great lodge in the sky where the old ones, the great rulers of the world, were, and that they might even be asked to sit in a humble place near to these wise ones and receive the great instruction. Now, if a priest, the medicine priest, was called out of his body and the great ones spoke to him, they told him the great magic. They told him the power to control the elements in the stars. They told him how to see at great distances. They told him how to travel invisibly from place to place. They told him all the secrets of the great magic of the great medicine lodge. This one then returned to his people a very high priest, invested with all miracles and wonders, and gained a great reputation. Now, we might also say that this all sounds like a lot of gibberish, that uh, uh, anyone could pretend these things, but uh, as my old Navajo friend, the Hustine Clark, used to say, it isn't so easy to do that when you live in a community of 70 families for 70 years. Who are you going to fool? You can't fool everybody all the time. You can't make up stories that never amount to anything. You can't guess and always be right. And if anything goes wrong and somebody dies because you've made a bad guess, you can't move into another community and start over again. You start, you believe, you carry your whole burden. You must either prove yourself or be disproved. And you are living forever under the watchful eyes of people who never forget. They know what you have said. You can never take it back. They know what you have promised. You can never fail. And to be sufficiently successful, to hold an honored and esteemed reputation in this little family of people that has no other doctor, no other lawyer, no other priest, no other confidence to do this and to do it without breaking the code, holding the personal respect and admiration as well as the professional respect of these people. You cannot just be a charlatan. You cannot just make up stories. You have to be right. If you say the buffalo are three days' journey to the north, the buffalo had better be there. If you say that this individual will get well, he had better get well. Maybe once in a while you can be wrong. Even the sky, stars in the sky seem to make mistakes. But you cannot make too many. You must be right most of the time. So that whatever it comes to these people, comes as it does to the, in the mysteries and initiations of the Cherokee Indians. And there are many very interesting rites and ceremonies. But always these mysteries and initiations have to do with bridging across from one world to another. They are all man searching for that which some way in his own heart he knows exists. And that is a tremendous living spiritual force. 
This is the very source and substance of the mana and of the orenda. Without these uh, terms, without these beliefs, this great complex of people could not have carried on their growth through the centuries. They could not have followed faithfully in the ways of their fathers. They could not have learned the great arts that they knew, some of which we are trying to rescue before these people become extinct or perhaps not because they die out physically, but because their culture dies out under the ridicule of stupid people. But actually, the old ways had something. And these old ways are deep and long. We have had our present beliefs for 500 years. We lived under the old way perhaps for 5 million years. Down inside of each of us, the old way is still there. And it is this old way, forever coming through, that brings mysticism into focus in a materialistic age. It is this old way which is the reason why materialism is a mood, but it can never finally dominate it. Because within us is this contact inwardly with the universe. Now we said in our discussion of the Greek mysteries that the great part of the mystery ritual was finally the communication of this inner spiritual reality. That man had to have a mystical experience by which he realized his victory over death. I think the same was exactly the case in the Western Hemisphere. That these mysteries, as practiced here, led, as in other regions, to the final state of conscious existence apart from body. Schoolcraft gives us another uh, important reference, and of course he is the outstanding authority on North American Indians. He says that one of the functions of the medicine priest was to go with the dead into the other world. Here we are back in the Egyptian ritual of the dead. Therefore, when a person was dying in one of the western tribes, the medicine priest was called in. And if according to his own insight and understanding the time had come for this soul to depart, he sat quietly in prayer or meditation beside the dying person, as the Tibetan Lama does in the ritual of the body. And when the death comes, the medicine priest goes into a trance. And according to the records that were preserved, the stories they told, uh, this priest in trance as it leaves his body and stands beside the spirit of the deceased person. He then takes his hand very gently and with great kindliness and leads him through the night to up, the stray, up a strange trail that is gray and mysterious until finally he comes to a beautiful valley uh, with a soft, radiant light. And here the Indian finds the village in the sky that is like the one he left behind. And here he is welcomed by those who went before him and comes as an honored friend and guest into a new region of life. Schoolcraft also points out that many of these tribes believed in reincarnation. Among others that had this belief, by the way, were the primitive Indians of California. So, here we have the guide guiding the soul of the Egyptian dead through the mystery leading to the Amenta. Uh, the Indian was not so sophisticated, therefore he did not have a judgment of the soul. The Indian took it for granted that he did the best he could. He took it for granted that he was neither better nor worse than the average. He did not believe that his God demanded perfection of a creature whom he had never taught. He did not believe that God required virtues that the human being had no opportunity to learn or no way of applying. The Indian lived naturally. His philosophy was very simple. He says, I will be honest. I will be honorable in my dealings with everyone. I will do good whenever I can. I will never turn a hungry person from my door. I will do none of the things uh, that it seems to me are not right. And therefore, when my time comes, I shall sing my death song proudly, 
and go forth to my father. I will go to the great Indian who understands Indian. I will also perhaps through him ultimately go on and on to a still greater being who understands all men. But the Indian said, whatever the old ones are that sit in my medicine lodge in the sky, they know me, they know my heart. They do not have to ask me questions. They do not have to try to decide what kind of a man I am. They know. They know my problem. And if I know in my heart that I have done as well as I could, I may go proudly into the house of my father. All of this has a lot of mysticism in it, but it is not quite as complicated and ritualistic as in some of the other philosophies that we may consider. But out of these primitive beliefs and out of this primitive thinking, I think we can trace that which in the Aztec and Maya culture complex gradually took form. We no longer the vigil alone in the night, now the vigil alone in the great sanctuary in the wilderness. Uh, no longer uh, the individual entirely alone, learning from the stars and from the earth, but now going into the presence of a priestly college that perhaps originated as he had previously experienced. But now this knowledge was in books. The records of herbs and simples were known. The simple principles of surgery and dentistry were already well understood in Central America. Uh, the Incas of Peru inlaid teeth with precious stones. Many of these people perform successful trepanning on the brain, and the patient lives. We know this from the condition of the soul. So these people knew many things, but I'm sure that by the time they reached the cultural level of the Maya, it was not just by going out and sitting in the forest. Now it was a case where all this forest wisdom that had all begun the same way, now had begun to be gathered to be put in tablets and in written form and to be traced in the enduring memories of orders of priests. So now the neophyte received the whole instruction of his people. But he also had to test himself and prove himself. And it was undoubtedly part of his discipline that if he wished to go on from education uh, to theurgy, that he would have to likewise be initiated would have to again pass through the fasting and all these higher rites that ultimately opened the inner consciousness and made it possible for him again to sit with the masters of his lodge in the great house in the sky. All of the mysteries had the same grand pageantry, and also they all had all the same wonderful simplicity in a way, because they were all aimed just as then is aimed toward a direct experience of something. No more just theorizing, no more just remembering, but something that happens to the person whereby he opens his own consciousness uh, to receive the great instruction. In the Eastern Seaboard and the mysteries uh, of the Long House, uh, the initiation of the child involves this element of a render that we have mentioned before. In this type of initiation, the young person was brought into a circle of his elders whom he regarded and admired, his living elders, and here in solemn and most systematic manner, he was told the story of his people. He was told of the honors that had gone before, of the bravery of his ancestors, of how good men had sacrificed their lives and their happiness in order that the tribe might survive, and how he owed to all of these who had gone before him a certain gratitude, for they had suffered and labored and died that he might live, that he might have a better kind of life. And therefore into his mind and into his heart must also flow the high resolution, the noble dedication, the commitment to the common good that was the virtue of his people. He must be like the best of the old one and the true one. He must accept his citizenship as the great responsibility. 
as the proof of his own manhood, which is his duty to guard the rights of his people, to guard their liberties, and also to guard his own nature against selfishness or anything that would destroy this beautiful chain of remembrance by which all that is good now is bound to the dreams of those who have gone before and also in a mysterious way is born and bound to the dreams of all who will come after. So in this way the young person received something. He felt moving into his own heart the tremendous wealth and strength of his people. He realized the privilege of being a man, the, the wonderful opportunity to be a, a true hero, uh, to give up all of himself, to do the very best that he could ever to bring on us. And as this spirit flared up in glory within himself until he knew that he had a destiny that was worthy of a man, then the old one said the arenda had come. The mystery of consciousness had opened in this person. This young individual now saw his destiny, saw his work, recognized his place, knew that he was desperately needed, knew how much there was to be done. And in those moments of, no, of knowing, he was initiated. He became one of his people. He lived with them, to labor for them, and to die with them. These were his duties. And to realize this was to have the spirit moving strong within him. Out of these situations, I believe the mysterious world came. And I think they developed through several stages on our Western Hemisphere. That climaxing in the uh, long house of the uh, seven uh, of the five nations of the Iroquois, or perhaps in the mysterious jungle temple of Chabalba. Regardless, it is part of the same mystery tradition that we trace in other parts of the world. Well, I guess our time is up, so we'll try it again next week.